Hey now, hello and welcome to episode 105 of Chairside Live. I'm Dr. Michael DeTola. Megan Strong is out on assignment. That assignment, give birth to a tiny human. In our case of the week this week, we've got an interesting case where I wanted to try something that I really hadn't done before. I've done some anterior bruxer restorations and they've turned out okay, but I had a case where I wanted to do a bruxer veneer in conjunction with that. Um, bruxer veneers have been something that we've seen dentists prescribing more. Uh, it makes me a little bit nervous because it's at times difficult to get a good bond of zirconia oxide unless you do everything right. But we've seen dentists who want to place veneers in patients' mouths who have a lot of attrition or have broken PFM restorations before. And for them, the strong zirconia oxide material is the right decision for going ahead with veneers. So I thought it's about time that I placed one. So this is going to be a simple, pretty straightforward case on tooth number eight and nine with a Bruxer crown and a Bruxer veneer. Adjacent to it, it is this week's case of the week. It's one of my own. Let's take a look at it now. As you can see, this patient's got a pre-existing PFM on tooth number eight, kind of high value, kind of opaque. He's a class two, division two. You can see that deep overbite that he's got going on here. So I like the idea of a Bruxer crown because I can keep it almost as thin as that PFM was on the lingual. So we're gonna go ahead and anesthetize and then take off this crown. That's a razor burr from Axis Dillon. Ah, oh, what a joy it is to cut off a PFM these days after cutting off nothing but Emacs and Bruxer. I feel like I'm on vacation when I'm taking off a, a PFM now. I literally will put my feet up and have a drink with an umbrella in it in the other hand as I take off the PFM because it's that relaxing. Because look at this, you just rotate with the crown remover back and forth and it just falls off. You know if that was a Bruxer crown, I would have had to cut it two or three more times uh, to get it off of there. You can see that it's been endodontically treated and that looks like the tip of a gold uh, post that we might be looking at in the incisal edge. What kind of gold, I'm not sure. We're going to start by putting our first cord in. This is a double zero ultra pack cord from Ultradent. You know, these types of preparations where you're not starting from scratch with a virgin tooth, where you're taking off a crown and it's already shaped and now you have to go in and kind of finish it, you can see how it's a little over tapered. And really all we're doing here for the most part, we're doing most of our preparation in the apical third of this tooth. So there's my favorite burr, the 856025 burr. It's an endodontically treated tooth and I don't have to do a ton of reduction. It's more about where I'm doing the reduction. So I've got the speed turned down to 2000 RPMs and I'm gonna do most of this reshaping dry. And I must have brushed that burr against the gingiva and that's why we've got a little bleeding there. So we're gonna use the Viscostat Clear uh, from Ultradent. That's always my first choice uh, for an astringent in the anterior because we don't get any discoloration of the gingiva. If that doesn't work, then we have to continue to move on and go to the ferric sulfate which works even better, but it will cause some discoloration on the gingiva. I've exposed a little bit of gold there, so I'm just gonna cover this up. Uh, this is a little, little Vertice Flow from Kerr. This is a self-etching composite resin, so I put it on the tooth and just agitate it with a brush for about 15 seconds. And then we're gonna go ahead and cure that, and once we've cured it, we can just add a little more composite. So because it's a self-adhering composite, we don't need to etch or use a separate bonding agent. Here I'm smoothing off the prep with an 856025 burr. So that's the exact same shape as that other coarse burr I was using. It's just much smoother, so it gets rid of all the little chips out of the margin. The top cord that goes into place is a 2E cord, Ultra Pack cord from Ultradent. The E stands for epinephrine. And in the case of a tooth like this where I have abraded the gingiva a little bit and the gingiva is already a little irritated, um, it feels good knowing that I've got uh, some epinephrine in there because I got a better chance of getting a nice impression. And uh, this patient was able to tolerate the epinephrine in the local anesthetic injection, so I think he's gonna be just fine uh, with it being in the cord. Uh, again, I've exposed a little part of the buildup there of the gold post uh, or core that's in place. That's gonna be okay, no nothing's gonna show through Bruxer. There's an anatomic compra cap that he had a little difficult time biting down on because of the way his bite is. And you can see when that top cord comes out, we just got a big old sulcus. It'd be hard to miss that impression, frankly. I mean, you've just basically got a moat around the castle and now we're just filling it up with the polyvinyl uh, material. And you know, that's what I love about the two cord technique as much as I'm always, you know, looking to help uh, dentists find a way. By the way, look at that. I don't know if you saw that lower anterior tooth with the wear on it from the PFM. But I'm always finding, uh, trying to find a better way for dentists so we don't have to pack two cords. And you know, I'm, I'm stumbling upon one now that looks like it might work, but you just don't get the same kind of consistent results 
that you do with that, that two chord technique, and that's one of the reasons I feel compelled to, uh, to stick with it. So it's been uh, about six days, and we're going to go ahead and take off the temporary now and, and clean things up and uh, try on the restorations and see uh, if, in fact, we like uh, how they look. And so we've got, look at a little temporary cement actually stuck right on that spot where the gold uh, buildup was. So we're just going to make sure that we clean off all this excess temporary cement. Sometimes we'll do it with a sonic scaler, especially if we use Duralon as a temporary cement. But we just want to make sure everything's nice and clean because that's one of the main reasons for crowns not seating completely is a little piece of temporary cement still on the tube. So we tried in both the restorations and the patient liked uh, how they look, so we're jumping right ahead to the cementation and the bonding. So that's the Preppies pumice from Whip Mix. I love this because it's disposable and it just gets used once and tossed away. I'm pretty sure that in my dad's polishing lathe in his dental office, the pumice that was in there had been there for about, uh, had been there for about 20 years and uh, it's pretty disgusting. I like having the unidose ones. We noticed that sharp angle um, on that central incisor where the arrow was pointing where that old composite is. So I'm, I'm just rounding that off a little bit um, because it looks on the model like I can't really see uh, that that sharp angle uh, is there. So we're just doing a little recontouring there and uh, now drying it off with the ADEC warm tooth dryer. This is uh, the one hose that we have on our unit that has never had any oil in it or had a handpiece uh, been run by it. And so it works uh, really well and uh, now we're putting this into place so we're going to cement this crown uh, with the uh, Ceramer cement, Ceramer C and B from Doxa. Again the thing I love about the Ceramer cement besides the easy cleanup is the fact that it bonds on its own to zirconia without needing to decontaminate the internal surface of the Bruxer crown or use a zirconia primer. Uh, so a couple nice things about the Ceramer where we don't have to worry about it. It'll typically clean up in just one piece. So as you see, I kind of teasing off with the Explorer as my assistant picks it up and that's how it cleans up. And it's mainly because it's the only um, permanent cement that I've ever used that goes through a doughy stage like that, which makes it simple to clean up and, and very easy uh, to clean up interproximally as well. So we don't get chunks stuck there like we used to with our resin modifying glass ionomer. So we've isolated uh, the two adjacent teeth with a couple mylar strips. And now we're gonna go ahead and etch. I can get the etch right up to the gingiva. In fact, I can even touch the gingiva because this is a no prep veneer. Anytime we prepare gingiva and we do temporary veneers, the gingiva almost always ends up being irritated. And uh, as a result, you have to be very careful getting acid etch near it. It will cause spontaneous bleeding, but we don't have to worry about that here. And since we don't have any dentin exposed, we're just going right to a bonding agent without any need for a primer here from the Scotch Bond system. And so we're painting that on all the surfaces of the tooth. And it's okay to get a little on the gingiva or in the sulcus. That's all going to be cleaned up later. So we will air thin that and go ahead and cure it. The thickness of this is not going to affect the seating uh, of this veneer. So even if it was a traditional prep veneer or a minimally prep veneer, we would do it the same way. You can see I've got a little bounce back there on the gingiva is I want to make sure that I get this nice and tight. And so because of that bounce back, on no prep veneers, we will, we will often kind of see that bounce back. So you all, at times have to hold it in place as you cure it to make sure that it doesn't move at all. And it's one of the things that you want to watch out for. In fact, when we do larger no prep cases, the way these veneers kind of float around as you're try to, trying to seat them into place is, is definitely something to keep an eye on. It's not the same as seating crowns or even regular prep veneers where they just go in one way and they slide down into place and that's where they stop. There's really no margin here for the restoration to contact as it goes down into place. Um, and as a result, they, they can move around and will often slide too far gingival. So it's something to kind of be uh, aware of. In the case of one like this, it's a little bit easier, but you could see if I had wanted to that I probably could have uh, overseated this and had it slide up uh, too far. Uh, sometimes uh, my technician that I work with here at the laboratory will put a little finger on a no prep veneer that actually wraps over the incisal edge so it'll slide down and it'll stop when that finger hits but then you have to take a burr out and cut off that little finger uh, afterwards. So um, here's the patient afterwards in the after photos. These were actually taken uh, uh, that same day right after that and so we still have a little dehydration there. Um, but looking pretty good considering that those are solid zirconia crowns. They don't look as good um, as natural teeth, but um, they're starting to look better and better because of the increased translucency 
in that material. And so now I'm feeling more confident that I'm, I'm placing a crown on a single anterior tooth that I can place a Bruxer veneer on the tooth next to it so that the two teeth match because as long as eight and nine match, we have a chance of having a nice smile. If eight and nine don't match, there's no chance that smile is going to look aesthetic or be pleasing to the patient. All right, now it's time for a segment we like to call viewer mail. I'm going to go ahead and reach deep into the chairside live mailbag, aka my jacket pocket. And um, let's see, uh, Dr. Bullock writes and says, uh, Hello, I would first like to say I'm a big fan of uh, chairside live. As such, I have been to Glidewell Labo's website multiple times. Love what you do. I'm a military dentist and unfortunately do not have an option to use a public lab. I want to ask your advice to a problem I have. As a military dentist, I sometimes must treat difficult prosthodontic patients. In my prior training, I've been taught to do a diagnostic wax up of where I would like to be where the treatment is done and use that as a guide to go through treatment. The problem is I hate doing wax ups. I'm slow and they require me to spend hours working on these large cases and I never like the wax up after I reach a certain stopping point. Also, I do not have the option of sending diagnostic casts to the military dental lab for a diagnostic wax up. That being said, how do you approach wax ups? What information do you think is critical for the provider to give you to, for a complete wax up? What tips or tricks do you think would be helpful for me to get through this without pulling my hair out? Thanks, Dr. Bullock. Well, that's actually what happened to me. Is that that's how I lost my hair. It was because of having to do my own wax ups um, I actually don't do the diagnostic wax ups. I can, of course, have uh, my technician here at the lab do it. And there's a couple things that I want to achieve with the diagnostic wax up. You asked what kind of information would the laboratory like from the provider? Well, certain things we want to know is this going to be a no prep case? Is this going to be a minimal prep case? Is this going to be a traditionally prepped or do we have our choice? Um, obviously, how many teeth are you and the patient willing to do? We'd like, you know, is there an option for some no preps behind it? If you're going to do seven through ten, would the patient possibly be interested in that? A big one is we need to know the length of the central incisor. You know, once we get the length of the central incisor, we can get the width off of that, and then kind of do golden proportion throughout the anterior teeth. But we need to know a few other things, like the patient's smile line would be helpful. Are you planning on doing any gingival recontouring or any kind of gingival surgery? Um, where are you with the overbite and the overjet? Are we trying to correct that? Is the midline going to stay the same? You know, just kinds of things like that where if they're not included, we assume that we're not changing them. So it's not that everything that comes in has to have, you know, 25 different things listed. Uh, but if it's not listed, we assume that it's either up to us to make any changes we see necessary or that those particular aesthetic requirements uh, aren't going to need to be changed. Um, for me as a dentist, there's a couple things that I like. The final diagnostic wax up I think is fantastic for uh, getting the patient excited about the treatment. If they're on the fence, we will often take a putty wash impression. So we'll take putty, mix it up, make a hot dog, push it down on the diagnostic wax up, take it off when it sets and trim it back. And then we'll take the, the D-wax and really define the gingival margins because sometimes they're a little sloppy where the stone and the wax come together at the gingival margin. So I'll take a half Holland back and just carve some really sharp margins in and then reline that putty horseshoe with some light body material, reseat the diagnostic wax up into that. And so now we have a great impression of the diagnostic wax up. We can use this during treatment if we need to, but we can also use it now We'll take a bisochrome material like uh, Luxatemp, and I'll always take a bleaching shade and squirt the bleach shade in there and then just put it onto the patient's teeth and let it set on their teeth and lock it into place. Now, obviously, for teeth that are going to be prepped a lot, um, we're not going to get a great representation of what it's going to look like. But especially in patients who have multiple diastema or deficiencies, you know, locking on this bisacryl and then just pulling off the uh, excess and letting them look in a mirror and see what it's going to look like is a very helpful way for them to be able to kind of envision what it's going to look like. And it's actually far more accurate than doing a simulation like this with a computer or just pulling a smile out of a library and, and kind of slapping it onto a photo of the patient because this is an impression of a D-wax made uh, in their mouth. So that can get them very excited to have treatment done. You can use that as a temporary if you're not going to use lab fabricated temporaries. But to me, the biggest part of all this I mean, the D-Wax is great, but there's another model that I want as well. 
And that's the prep model that the DWACS was made on. So when I send in the original study model, I say, hey, we're going to be prepping this patient. We're doing Emax crowns on uh, whatever. We're doing Emax crowns on 5, 8, 9, uh, and 12, and Emax veneers on the rest. Um, I want to see how much they're going to prepare. I want to see how much they prepared on the crowns. And on those veneer preps, if I give them the ability to prep however much they need to make it look good, I want to see how much is taken off all of those teeth. And then I want to suck down stent over that as well. So I can check and make sure that I've done enough reduction in the mouth. So it's great to see a DWAX and see where the technician believes we can end up with this case and get the patient's approval on it so that we're all in agreement. But then I need to know how much I need to prep. And if all I get back from the lab is a DWAX, I don't know how much they reduced and I don't know where they reduced it. And I don't want to handcuff the technician's hands by not reducing enough on the distal of number nine or the mesial of number seven or whatever it might be. So in addition to the DWACS, I get back the prep model. So once the technician has done all the prepping and they're ready to start the DWACS, I have them dupe that model for me and we call it a prep guide. That has a stent, a thermoform suck down stent on top of that that's done. And then the DWACS is done. And typically the lab will even duplicate the DWACS model and then it'll actually give me a suck down over that as well. If they don't, then I can do that putty wash thing that I was talking about and put that in the patient's mouth. I usually do that anyway, just because it's a little more accurate around the gingiva than it is with a suck down. A suck down is a good approximation, but there's more gingival cleanup, and I like to get that nice finish line there. So for me, the DWAX is a great way to motivate patients. It's a great way, uh, if it's a male patient, to be able to take it home and kind of show their wife what it's going to look like. I prefer white wax on a white model for that reason, just because it looks really nice and it's visually uh, appealing. But for me, the big part of it is I know my ceramist is going to be able to get to that final wax up to, to that shape and size and length and all that good stuff if I reduce enough tooth structure in the right places. And that's why for me, uh, the prep guide, the, the duped version of the prep model, is just as important to me uh, as is having the, the diagnostic wax up. Maybe more so from my point of view, because I'm probably going to use biotemps with the case anyway. And lastly, I will often use biotemps as a diagnostic wax up. So again, I will take that study model, send it to the biotemps department, and they were actually going to make basically a DWAX, except it's going to be biotemps that I can actually reline and place in the patient's mouth. And so now we get a good indication during the two weeks of provisionalization whether or not the patient likes how this smile is going to look. Because if this is what they like, this is now a CAD CAM file which can be used for the final milled restorations. And so sometimes I'll use the biotemps as kind of a functional diagnostic wax up, if you will, because it can be relined and put in the mouth, unlike the other one, which obviously is just wax that's sitting on a model and can't be used uh, quite in that same way. So thank you very much, Dr. Bullock. Appreciate you writing in. Sorry. Uh, that you, you get stuck doing these on your own. Uh, if forced to do it on my own, uh, I think I would, I might skip the DWAX part of it altogether, to be honest with you. And I think I would just take that study model and uh, I would prep it back until I felt like it was enough. And then I just start slapping wax on to make sure I had the minimum thickness that I needed for the restorations without getting too fancy anywhere else. I would just want to make sure um, that I reduced enough in the mouth. And so it'd be a nice trial run or a mock uh, prepping to get the chance to do it once on that diagnostic model. So thank you for writing in. And uh, if you ever get out of the military, feel free to send us a model and uh, your first DWAX free of charge. It's on me. Well, that about wraps it up for this first Meganless edition of Chairside Live. And if you miss seeing her like I do, well, there's really only one thing to do. That's right. Email her husband and ask for some pictures. And here's what we got. This first one, oh, look how sweet. Oh, I don't know how old she is there. I'm not very good at judging kids. She's somewhere between, say, 1 and 17, I think, in that picture, but just looking darling. And in this next one, if you ever wondered what toothless Megan would look like, and I'll be honest, the thoughts crossed my mind, there she is without one of her central incisors. How cute is that? And now she's out front, and I think she might even be younger than the last one we showed. Uh, but there's the Megan smile that I see on rare occasion. I usually see the look of disgust on her face while we're here on the set. And lastly, wow, look at that. That must be her third grade formal. That's probably uh, in high school, I'm guessing. And there's that million dollar smile. Look at that. Just amazing. So, Megan, uh, if you're watching on bed rest, I uh, just wanted to let you know we're thinking of you and we all miss you here on the set. 
So on behalf of myself, Remote Megan, the CSL crew, and everybody here at the lab, I want to thank you for your time and your continued commitment to quality dentistry. Give birth to a tiny human.